Please hand your quizzes in towards the end of each row. Time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Time is up. Thank you. Hi. Hey, how are you? How's the wedding plans coming? It's good. We were like strictly, I think like 29 minutes and I look like cutthroat. Yes, my body broke. The test. <laughs> Time is up, folks. Come on. Yeah. I didn't include the time. Okay. there any more quizzes, bring them down. Time is up. So problems one and three. Problems one and three, I think, were pretty much in line with previous quizzes, right? Problem one, you've seen versions of it. There might have been a little twist here. And problem three was, you know, Problem two was a little interesting. It wasn't difficult, but you had to make up your mind. You know what you had to make up your mind on? Whether you wanted to compute the EV to sales today or the EV to sales five years from now. Either way, I'll give you full credit, but you have to stay internally consistent. If you use the EV to sales today, using today's numbers, current numbers, your return on invested capital will be a negative number because you're losing money. Your expected growth is going to be a big positive number because you have high growth rate between now and year five, and you get a high EV to sales, or you get an EV to sales today, and you can apply it to revenues today. I really didn't want you to do that. I wanted you to go the other way, but because the problem was fuzzy enough that if you did that and you stayed consistent, I'll give you full credit. But I set up that second problem because some of you on your project, remember the project? will have money losing companies, and I want you to remember this problem. Because you know why I gave you your five? There's substance to your five. Things are changing. Your company's actually making money. Its revenues are actually substantial. If you use the year five numbers to get to EV to sales, first you got to decide the return on invested capital will be the return on invested capital in year five, which is, a big pos which is a positive number. But then you have to come up with a growth rate, right? And you cannot use the growth rate over the next th year one through five. It's got to be the growth rate after year five. And I made your life easier by saying after year five, your growth rate is going to be? 3% a year forever. You plug in the 3% growth rate. You're going to get an EV to sales in year five. What are you going to do next? Help me out. So what's the next step? I'm going to multiply by revenues in year five. I'm going to get an enterprise value in year five. But I want the value today. So I need to bring it back to today. So what discount rate do I use? I gave you two different costs of capital. One for the next five years and one after year five. 
Why? And give me the intuition as to why. Because I'm going to live through the next five years to get to year five, and I have a risky five years coming up, so I'm going to have to discount back at that higher cost of capital. I'm going to get an enterprise value today. Final question. I get the enterprise value today. The question I asked you about the equity value per share today, or the equity value today. So which cash and which debt do I subtract out from that discount to the enterprise value? Today's cash and today's debt. So even if you got the problem wrong, use that as a template for if you have to deal with money losing companies, we have to do, because you try to put today's numbers into any of those pricing equations, things are gonna blow up on you. So really that question was meant to kind of, I know it didn't feel like it, I was helping you, but it's really to kind of help you on the project because even if you got it wrong, you will now have a template to, as to what to do on your project. So that's another, as you notice, the nagging will continue. It will rise to, a, you know, to an exponential pitch this week. So I might be sending you three emails every day saying, how's the project coming? Are you done yet? You know, so, I would ex so if you want to shut me off, fine. If you're done with the project. But I'm going to nag you till you're done. So it's, uh, for the next two weeks, you're going to see things building up. So if any, any other questions? So the usual rules apply. As soon as the quizzes are graded, I will let you know. You can come pick them up at the usual spot. So all's well. So let's move on, move back to what we were talking about. We're talking about applying option pricing to value a patent. And I said you can use this to actually value a young biotech company that derives the bulk of its value from a, from a patent, a license, an exclusive right. Okay? Yesterday I got an email from somebody who's patented this new technology which allows people with bad eyesight, the, to, which allows phones to adjust your eyesight so you don't have to put your glasses on to see what's in the phone. And he's come up with this idea, he's got the concept down, he's got everything, he's got it patented, and he's trying to sell it. And he's saying, how do you come up with the value? Can you use? And my advice to him was to think of it as an option. Basically, you're selling an option, and you have, to, you have to do all the homework you do with a traditional valuation, but you have to take that extra step of thinking it as an option. So today, I want to look at a second application of the option to delay. You're a natural resource company, an oil company, a gold mining company. Some of your reserves are developed reserves. You can value them like any other asset based on the cash flows, but some of your reserves are undeveloped reserves. Okay. So let's set up some, again, parameters. Let's assume that you have a sense of how much oil is in those undeveloped reserves. You're an oil company. And what the value of the oil would be if you extracted the oil today. So let's give that value the type. So let's say that value is V. And let's say the cost of developing those reserves today is X. So if you develop the reserves today, you'll get V minus X. And if these reserves are not viable today, V minus X could be a negative number. So think of it as an option. If V gets to be higher than X, you will develop the reserves and keep the difference. If V stays below X, the value of the oil under the ground is less than the cost, you will just leave the option under the ground and hope that oil prices go up. So let's draw the payoff diagram. And you see me do this on every real option because it forces me to stay disciplined. So this is what the option looks like on an undeveloped reserve. The cost of developing the reserve becomes the strike price. If the value of the oil under the ground exceeds that cost, you will develop the reserve and make the difference. And if the cost, if the value is less than the cost, you will leave the oil under the ground and hope oil prices go up. Okay? So if you think about valuing this option, we need some input. So again, I'm, every time I have to do option pricing, I'm going to go back to SK, RT, and Sigma because I need those numbers to get the option pricing model going. So let's see how you get the inputs to value this undeveloped reserve. The value of the oil under the ground, you're going to get by looking at the reserves times the existing oil price. So you're making no judgments about the future. You're saying, if I develop the reserve today, what the cash flows be? You take the present value. That becomes the S in the model. The strike price is what it'll cost you to develop the reserve. And that's going to vary depending on where the reserves are. If the reserves are in Saudi Arabia, all you have to do is stick a finger in the sand and the oil comes out. And it's estimated that Aramco, it costs about $7 a barrel to actually get the oil out. Whereas if it's in Canada, it might be under 5,000 feet and under shale and under snow and under ice, God only knows what it might cost you. So the cost of developing the reserve can be different depending on which part of the world you're in. So that becomes the strike price. The li life of this option is a little tricky. 
In most cases, when you see oil companies get reserves, they don't get them in perpetuity. They bid for them in an auction, and they're given the rights for 10, 15, 20, 25 years. That becomes the life of the option. Saying, what if there is that not, we'll talk about what to do if you have an oil reserve without a specified life. But the life of the option here is the period of time that you get the rights to develop these reserves. The variance in value here is actually simpler than it was in the patent example. Because what's your, the one thing you're most uncertain about here? You know roughly how much oil there is under the ground. You know roughly what it's going to cost you to develop the reserve. What you don't know is what the oil price will be. So when I think about the variance here, I'm going to look at the variance in the log of the oil price because that's the thing that's driving the value of these reserves. So that becomes the, the sigma in the model. If I decide to develop the reserves, then I get the oil out, I can sell them, I get cash flows. So I'm going to introduce a cost of delay. Again, as with the patent, I want you to exercise this option. I want you to develop these reserves. I want you to sit there on these reserves to the very last day. So once the reserves become viable, here's the cost. By not developing the reserve, you're giving up the cash flows you would get from developing the reserve. So that become the equivalent, becomes the equivalent to the cost of delay of the dividend yield. And finally, there's one special feature of, of this particular real option that you've got to factor in. Let's say oil prices go to $100 a barrel. And ExxonMobil decides to develop all its reserves right now. So a guy at headquarters picks up the phone and says, develop the reserves. Does oil come out of the ground the next day? Once you decide to develop the reserves, a whole process has to kick in, right? Those engineers have to show up. They have to put up the rigs. It might take you a year and a half, two, three years before the oil actually comes out of the ground. And that exposes you to two problems. The first is that the oil price, which is $80, at the time you make this decision, by the time the oil comes out, it might be only $50. That's a fixable problem, because if you're developing the reserves, What's the next thing you're going to do? You're going to buy futures, and you're going to, so let's say you can do that. There's a second problem, which is for the next two years, you actually get no cash flows. There's a cost, of, there's a development lag between the time you decide to exercise and the time that the option gets actually exercised. So I've got to bring that into the value because it's going to reduce the value of my option. So I'm going to use a very simple example from way back in time, and I'll explain why I didn't use a more updated oil company example. So a company called Gulf Oil was targeted in a hostile takeover in the early 1980s. A lot of oil companies were being targeted then. And one of the reasons it got targeted in a takeover was because it had all these undeveloped reserves, 3,038 million barrels of undeveloped reserves. And at that time, it was estimated the cost of developing this reserve would be about $10 a barrel. So collectively, if you developed all those reserves, it will cost you $30.38 billion. There's a two-year lag in development, which means between the time you decide to develop the reserves and oil comes out, it takes you two years. The average life of the reserves was about 12 years. Some of, the, some of these reserves were four, some were eight, some were 16, some were 20, but the average across all the reserves were 12 years. And the price of barrel per, uh, per, no, per barrel of oil at the time that I did this was about $22.38 a barrel. The variable cost was $7. So per barrel of oil you get out of the ground, you're going to make $15.38. T-bond rate was about 9%. And once you develop the reserves, it was estimated that the cash flows you would get would be about 5% of the value of the reserves. So 3,038 million barrels of undeveloped reserves. Cost of development is about $10 a barrel, but you've got to wait two years for the development to play off. And every barrel of oil that you get gets you $15.38. So let's start by doing a traditional discounted cash flow valuation of these reserves, where you develop the reserves right away and see what the value is. So here's what I get. If I look at the value of the oil under the ground, 3,038 million barrels, $15.38 per barrel, that's how much value I'm going to get from the oil under the ground. But remember, I don't get the cash flows for the first two years. So the way I deal with that is I discount back that value by two years. It looks like I'm discounting, but what I'm effectively doing is taking out the first two years of cash flow, saying I'm not going to get those cash flows for the first two years. The value that I get for the oil under the ground is $42.38 billion. So if I develop the reserves right away, I can expect to get $42.38 billion of value. The cost of developing the reserve was $30.38 billion. If I take the difference between those two values, the $12 billion, is my discounted cash flow valuation for the reserves. Somebody keep track of that because now I'm going to value these undeveloped reserves as an option. 
Here's what the option is. I have 12 years left to develop these reserves, right? There is a variance in the oil price of 0.03. So oil prices go up and down. Variances will always look like small numbers because they're percentage squared. You know, you know what I mean by that? 20%. So when you take point, if you take a standard deviation of 20%, that's 0 0.2. 0 0.2 squared is 0 0.04. So when you see 0.03, it looks slow. But remember, that's a 300% squared, right? If that's too confusing, just think of it in standard deviation terms. So variance in log of oil prices is 0.03. I have 12 years to play the game. The riskless rate was 9%. And every year that I choose not to play this game, I, de I don't develop the results, I give up those 5% in cash flows. That operates like a dividend yield. I plug the numbers in D1, D2, N of D1, N of D2. And when I value the call option, I get 13.3 billion. So what was the value from the DCF valuation? It was 12 billion, right? Now as an option, I'm valuing at 13.3 billion. This is like magic. Where did the extra 1.3 billion in value come from here? What's causing it? Just take a look at the inputs and tell me what it is that's causing the extra 1.3 billion. Not investing that seven billion or seven dollars for that. Not investing the well, that's the standard present value problem, right? Because you get that any time you have time value of money, it's got to be more than that's not investing. What if I set the variance of oil prices to zero? What would happen to the value of this option? It'll become 12 billion. So the first thing that's driving this extra 1.3 billion is oil prices are volatile. What if I set the life of the reserves to zero years? What's going to happen to the value option? It's going to go back to 12 billion. There are two things keeping this extra 1.3 billion afloat. The first is oil prices are volatile. The second is I have 12 years to decide when to develop the oil. So when you have undeveloped reserves, it's not just the level of oil prices that matters. It's the variance in that oil price that drives the extra premium on the option. There are lots of oil companies around the world now with non-viable oil reserves. If you did a traditional discounted cash flow valuation right now of those companies, you'd conclude those reserves are worth nothing. Why? It's, it's you know, cost $75 a barrel, price right now is 60, so I'm gonna ignore them. Don't ignore them because they still have optionality and that optionality will mean those undeveloped reserves continue to have value because oil prices can move. So that's the value of my undeveloped reserves. Let's complete this valuation. Yes? Yeah. You do the same math? Absolutely. Okay. But then your DCF value would also be higher, right? So basically, let's say oil prices rise to 24. My DCF value would go from 12 billion to 13.2 billion. And then on top of that, the premium is always on top of my DCF value. And if the oil price jumps from 22 to 24 quickly, then you know what might also affect my expect. Remember, these are all expected numbers. So if the expected volatility of oil prices are higher, that's going to add to the premium. So whenever oil prices change, the value of everything changes, developed and undeveloped reserves. But the variance is driving the premium on top of that DCF value. And if, for example, my cost in this case is like 30, You could still do that, absolutely. In fact, if you get 30, what's your DCF value going to look like? It's going to be negative, right? So they basically it says don't develop the reserves now. But because oil prices are, are, are volatile, you can still have an option value that is positive. I mean, this is actually, I mean, if you think of a company like Petrobras that has huge undeveloped reserves that are not viable right now, their only hope is oil prices get incredibly volatile and maybe I'll get bailed out because otherwise those reserves are just going to stay as non-viable reserves. Okay. Any questions? So let's complete this process. I've got the value of the undeveloped reserves, 13.3 billion. Let's bring in the rest of Gulf oil. Gulf Oil had developed reserves on which it was getting about $915 million in cash flows every year. There were about 12 years of cash, I'm sorry, 10 years of cash flows left in those reserves. So I just took the present value of the $915 million every year for the next 10 years. At the cost of capital, because it is an oil company, I got a present value of $5.066 billion. That gets added on. I subtract the debt. I get a value for the equity. I divide by the value per share. So I could take an oil company, and rather than doing the traditional DCF way, where I give it higher growth because it's, it's got lots of reserves, I can value it in two slices. Develop reserves as a DCF, undeveloped reserves using an option pricing model. 
You know why I did not do this with an up? You're saying, why don't you just pick Exxon Mobil and do this? Do oil companies report undeveloped reserves on their annual, in their annual reports? They actually do, but they report only viable undeveloped reserves. Don't ask me why the accounting was written in such a, in such a way. But only if you're undeveloped. In, in, in option pricing terminology, what are they then reporting? Only they're in the money options. I think if I were to rewrite the disclosure requirements for oil companies, it would require them to report all undeveloped reserves. And then if they want to break it out by you know, viable and non-viable, that's good because I can value each separately. But the reason it's tough to apply as an investor on a company is the information you need on those undeveloped reserves is incomplete. It's usually only in acquisitions that you start to see the information percolate to the top. Anadarko has now been targeted in an acquisition. Occidental is one, and who's the other player in the game? Chevron. Chevron. So basically, you take those two companies and you say, why are they bidding? I'm not sure it's because of undeveloped reserves. You could take Anadarko and look at the value of the undeveloped reserves and see if you can value it as an option. There might be enough information for you to do that. So that is the option to develop an undeveloped reserve. So let's pass it through those tests. I forgot to pass the option. The, the, no, let's take first the patent, right? Remember the three questions. Is there an option in here? Obviously, the contingent payoff is if the value of the cash flows from developing the patent are greater than the cost, I'll develop it. Is there exclusivity in the patent? Where does the exclusivity come from? You get legal protection to the extent. And it's not just the patent. That the patent is legally protected. If you're in a country where there are patents and nobody protects it, there is no optionary. And third, can I apply an option pricing model? With the patent, I was on really shaky ground. Think of why. To use the option pricing model, what do I need? I need to be able to trade the underlying asset and trade the option. I can do neither with the patent. The underlying asset of the patent is the drug that comes out of the patent. I can't trade that. And the patent itself is not tradable. But let's take undeveloped reserves through the same questions. Is there an option here? Or what is the underlying asset? the oil under the ground, and the contingency is, if the value of the oil exceeds the cost of development, I will develop and do it. So clearly there's an option. Is there exclusivity? Yes. And where does it come from? We own the oil. There is only so much oil under the ground, right? With natural resource companies, it's natural scarcity that puts a limit on it. Because if oil prices go to $200 a barrel, I can't go to my back and say, I'm going to look for oil. I could, but I'm not going to find oil. Anytime you have natural scarcity, there is optionality. Anybody here in real estate? Nobody wants to admit to it? Right, that's fine. Do you know that real estate in Manhattan has an option value, but real estate in Kansas City does not? Think of why. In Kansas City, if real estate prices go up, you know what? You keep building. You're in the middle of nowhere. Nothing within 100 miles of you. You just keep building and building and building. It's like going to Las Vegas. Each time you go, the sprawl spreads. But real estate in Manhattan has a natural scarcity. You're on an island. And in fact, this is not just an island. It's one of the most heavily zoned islands in the world. You know, every square inch of Manhattan is already spoken for. There's only so much you can build on. I still remember when we built this building in 91. We got 60 million, which is twice what Duke got. We thought we'd get twice the size of the building. We didn't realize how different costs were in North Carolina versus New York. So the architect puts up a 14-story building. We're all pretty happy, 14 stories. So this is six months in. We paid this guy. He comes up with 14 stories. We're all ready to build. And then an urgent faculty meeting is called. And the architect comes back and says, you know what, guys? We can't build 14 floors. So why not? Because, and this is a true story, NYU actually borrowed, there's actually a certain amount of square footage that can be built on this land in front of uh, Stern. NYU borrowed square footage, don't even ask me how this is allowed, from this space and used it to build what was called Cold Center, which is the old jet. And they'd used up, so they said, we'd have to knock off three floors. Now, our initial reaction was, you can't just, can you just knock off the three floors? But it turns out the architecture doesn't work that way. You can't just take that. He actually had to go back to the drawing board, take another six months, and come up with a new design. That's why the, the elevator stops at the 11th floor. 
but that's how, le how heavily regulated. The so if you were bidding for a three-story building in Manhattan, there could be two three-story buildings next to each other, but one has the capacity to add nine floors and the other doesn't you're going to pay a heck of a lot more for the first building over the second, even though real estate values might be low now, because you get the option to add an extra nine floors. So anytime there's natural scarcity, there's going to be optionality. And anytime there's optionality, you're going to pay a premium over the traditional discounted cash flow valuation. Which brings me to the option to expect. Of all of the real options, this is the one that gets consultants CEOs and bankers most excited. You're going to see very quickly why. The option to expand requires two projects. The first project is a negative net present value project. Everybody accepts it's negative net, it's a bad project. But what it gives you is the right to a second project, an, op, an expansion project, which could be in a big market. So if you are writing this in terms of a payoff diagram, here's what it would look like. There is an expansion option. The cost of expansion becomes the equivalent of the strike price. You will do it only if the present value of the cash flows from expanding exceed that cost. And if that doesn't happen, guess what you lose? What did I describe the first project as having? A negative net present value. That becomes the cost of this option to expand. So I'll give you a very simple example of how this would work out. But, you know, so let's say you're valuing a software company. A software company produces you know, software to secure your, your, your PCs and your Macs. You come up with a discounted cash flow valuation of 115 million. So they basically sell security software, and you've done a traditional DCF valuation, 115 million. And then the software company says, look, we also have a platform here where we're collecting information on our users, they're going to tell us what viruses are attacking them. So over time, we're going to be able to develop a database that we might be able to use to sell other products. We don't know what those products are, but this is a platform argument. We're building a platform of users, and we're collecting data, and that data might allow us to come up with new products in the future. I know this is reaching, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to assume that it'll cost about a half a billion to develop this database software. And that right now, based on what you know, you think you can make only 40 million in cash flows every year for the next 10 years from developing. Already you can see, this is not a good investment if you do it right now, right? 500 million upfront, 40 million for 10 years, even without discounting, is only 480 million. And if you add to that the cost of capital of 12%, this is definitely a negative net present value investment. So what am I giving you? I'm asking you to take a project that is a negative net present value project. You're saying, I'm not going to do it, but I'll give you the rights to do this for the next five years. So over the next five years, you can do it at any time. This, this is an extraordinarily risky business. The standard deviation in value is about 50% because you don't know much about how this business will evolve, and the risk-free rate is 3%. So the DCF value is 115 million, but you're wondering whether this capacity to add another product might add to that value. So let's value it as an option. If you value it as an option, here's what the numbers look like. The present value of the cash flows, if you did this today, would be 40 million discounted back at 12% every year for the next 10 years. The value is 226 million. The cost of doing this is a half a billion. You have five years over which you can make this decision. And the standard deviation, which means the 226 million could become 350 million or 10, 10 million over the next five years, is 50%. The riskless rate is 3%. You plug the numbers in, it's almost magical. This looks like it's a terrible investment, right? But the rights to this terrible investment because of whatever is worth 56 million. So let me ask you a question. What's giving this option so much value? It's a hugely risky business, right? Do you see why people love this? Because all the things that used to be penalties, I'm rewarding you for Say, I know nothing about the business. That's great. There's a lot of risk in the business, even better. The more risky the business, the higher the value of the option because it's a, now do you see why people pay for platforms and big data? Because this is the allure of the process, is that uncertainty about the future combined with the fact that I could do things with this, add to that value. It's an incredibly diff difficult option to value. Okay? I'll give you an example. When I valued Facebook last year, I did a traditional DCF valuation where I estimated the cash flows from their core business, which is what? How does Facebook make some ads? Basically, I valued it as an online advertising company. I came up with about $180 per share. 
But that is basically the value if they just continue to sell advertising to their 2.3 billion users. But you see the platform here? They have 2.3 billion users on that platform who spend an insane amount of time every day on it. Do you know how much time the average Facebook user spends on Facebook each day? 57 minutes a day. And that's not including WhatsApp or Instagram. That's kind of scary. One out of every 16 waking hours of 2.3 billion people on the face of the earth is spent on Facebook. You know, deal with that. Right? But if you're getting 2.3 billion people on your platform an hour every day, Think of what else you can do with them, right? You can sell them entertainment, you can deliver news to them. Right now they haven't figured out what to do yet because of, you know, I guess restrictions on what that might mean. It might be a little creepy if you start getting news that's tailored to your Facebook profile. You might already be getting that, right? But to the extent that they can do it, there is this added value. I can't put a number on it. And I'm not willing to do that, willing to put a number. But here's how it plays out in my decision-making process. I valued Facebook at 180. Let's say the stock price is 177. On a normal stock, what's your reaction going to be? That's pretty close to fair value. I'm not buying, right? But in a stock where there is this potential optionality, even though you're not willing to put a number on it, I know the 180 is going to be the base from which I build off. So even though the stock price is pretty close to value, I'd be much more willing to buy a stock where there is this real option on top of my DCF value, even though I don't put a number on it. So even if you never get to the point of putting a number on it, it could affect your decisions on whether to buy the stock or not. I'm sorry? That 2.3 billion people that they can sell them other stuff. They could sell it. They could be a retail company. They could be an entertainment company. And the fact is, where does the, where does the value come from? The exclusivity, that they have a platform of 2.3 billion users for an hour a day. That is really the basis for both the big data and the platform arguments for optionality. But I'm going to give you a couple of questions, because this might work with Facebook, but there are other companies where the argument is not going to be as strong to add an option premium. So here's my test when somebody talks about real options, because right now this is you know, platform value. People want me to pay for Slack. They want me to pay for Lyft. They want me to pay for Uber. And with every one of the argument is there's a platform here. You're getting the platform. The first is, you've got to convince me that I need the first investment to get to the second. Remember that first investment where I lost money? So you've got to convince me that by paying more than the DCF value, I am getting an option. So that's the first step. And second, you got to show me that you have some exclusivity. With Facebook, clearly they do. They do because you have to be on their platform to interact on Facebook. Now, Uber claims that they have a platform. I'm a little more wary. They have 91 million riders. But what do you do with them? I mean, the only thing I can think of is maybe you can show ads and you can put little TVs in the cars like they do in, in taxis. No? Maybe in Uber cars, they'll put them up. But that platform, the exclusivity is much weaker. So the weaker the exclusivity, the less value there is to the option. In fact, I've listed a bunch of different you know, comparative advantages, ranging from absolute protection to the advantage you state when you can't think of a good one, which is I was there first. Right? Because that basically means I can't think of a good advantage, but I was there first. And often with these platform companies, that becomes the basis. You, have you seen these dockless you know, scooters? And, I mean, basically, I, you, know, you can open with an app, Bird, Lime. I don't see as many of them in New York City. Are they banned in the city? Yeah. They must be, OK. I mean, I live in San Diego, and I get run over, or close to getting run over, at least six times every hour. right? Because <laughs> you've got crazy, drunk 23-year-olds, often two to a scooter, kind of coming down. But this is a you know, Bird was valued, or price. Let me take that word, price at about $2 billion. It's a horrifically bad business for two reasons. One is that they charge very little. It's a, you know, in terms of, you know, you use it for six blocks, they might charge you a dollar and a half. And at least in San Diego, one out of five bikes gets thrown off the cliff into the ocean every day. I mean, high schoolers in San Diego, this is their big leisure activity. Let's see how many bird scooters we can get rid of today. I mean, all you have to do is work out the numbers. There is no way you're making money on this business. So the question is, what? Why would you pay for it? And the answers I got was big data. What does that mean? 
Well, I know when you got on your bike and when you got off. Okay. You think you're the only person who knows? You know how many people are keeping track of me? Take your iPhone up and check out how many of your apps are, are tracking you every moment of every day. There's nothing unique about you tracking me. There's zero value to the big data you get from tracking people on a scooter. So don't even talk to me about a big data premium here, because big data to a value has to have some exclusivity. If you're Netflix and you talk about the value of big data, I'm willing to listen. Why? Because they're collecting data that is exclusive to them. What do, they, what do they know about you? First, they know when you turn the TV on. Second, you know, they know what show you're watching. Third, they know what shows you stop watching. And it's kind of creepy. You open up Netflix, and you left it halfway there. Because I have a bunch of shows. Halfway through the first episode, I gave up on the show. Like yesterday, the Game of Thrones, you know. It's so dark, I couldn't see a thing happening. I could see people. <laughs> now, what the heck was that all about, right? So there are shows like that where two-thirds of the show, I turn it off saying, I'm, I'm done. And they track every single show I've stopped watching. You're saying, how does it help them? They produce content now. They know what you like, what you watched all the way through. I like shows where people kill each other all the time. I get new shows coming at me constantly. I like shows like The Punisher and Luke Cage. You put me down the list of those shows. They keep showing me shows like that. They collect information that's exclusive to me, and they use it to design content. That is big data. And it's used. The two companies that use big data the best are Amazon and Netflix. Google and Facebook are close, but Amazon and Netflix are in a, are in a class by themselves. That's big data. So when you hear big data arguments, you're hearing a real options argument, put it to the exclusivity test. So when you look at real options test, for, for a, is there an option? Yes. It's kind of a, it's a second investment you could make, not the first one. And the contingency is the present value of the cash flows from expanding exceed the cost, you will do it. Is there exclusivity? Depends. And this is where real options, the option to expand is very different from the patent or the natural resource, because clearly there's exclusivity there. Here, what's the exclusivity? And you've got to show me. And third, can I use an option pricing model to value it? Yes, but I've got to be very careful. Why? Nothing is traded here, right? The option's not traded. The underlying asset is not traded. So when I attach an option pricing number, it's just a number. I can't monetize it. And that's why with a company like Facebook, I wouldn't even try. It becomes something that affects my decision. But it's not something I'm willing to put a number on because I'm not sure what that number is going to look like. Final option is the option to abandon. It's always nice to be able to walk away from your mistakes, as I said. And that's what your option to abandon gives you. It gives you the right to walk away from an investment. If what happens? If the value of the cash flows is less than what you will get by abandoning that asset. This is one of the few real options that's a put option. Almost all real options are call options. This is a put option. It gives you a right to walk away from a bad investment. So I'll give you a very simple example of an option to abandon. Let's say that you're Airbus, and I am you know, Lear Aircraft. Lear Aircraft produces these tiny executive jets. But I come to you with a proposal where we can make small commercial aircraft, 30 to 40 people. I don't know enough to do this on my own. You don't know enough about small aircraft to do this on your own. So let's do it as a joint venture. So your Airbus, you're going to make this decision. Yeah? So you'll have to invest a half a billion. I'll invest a half a billion. We each invest. And right now, based, you do the analysis, and based on what you can see in expected cash flows, the present value of expected cash flows is 480 million. So based on those two numbers, for you as Airbus, this looks like a negative net present value investment, right? You're investing a half a billion, you're getting back 480 million, that's minus 20 million. But I really want you as my partner, so I come with a counter proposal. I said, look, if you're my joint venture partner, I'll buy your share out any time over the next five years for 400 million. Less than what you paid, but I'll give you a floor on how much you can lose. The most you can lose then is a, about 100, because you invest 500 million up front. I'll let you walk away with 400 million any time over the next five years. I've given you the option to abandon this investment. Let's assume that this is a 30 year investment and that the variance in the value of this cash flows is about 0.16. So that the 480 million that I estimated could become 650 million or 350 million. So I've given you the option to abandon. Let's, say, let's see what this option is worth. 
First, for the present value of the cash flows, I look at what would happen if I entered the joint venture today, which is 480 million. That's your share of the cash flows. The cost, the strike price here, because you can walk away with the put option, is 400 million. So right now, it doesn't make sense for you to abandon because it's the put, what you would get is 400 million. You're getting 480 million by staying with the project. But if the project starts to go bad, you can walk away from this project any time over the next five years. It's a 30 year project. Never give somebody the option to abandon for the next 30 years, because you know what's going to happen, right? For the next 29 years and 364 days, they're going to collect the cash flows, and the last day they're going to show up and say, I never liked this project. Can you give me the 400 million? So that's why it stops after five years. Is after five years, the optionality goes away. So the life of the option is the five years. The equivalent of the dividend yield here is remember each year your underlying asset, which is the project, is going to lose some value because it's a finite life project. So it's a 30 year project, then it becomes a 29 year project, then a 28. So I've roughly estimated that by taking one over F. Again, you can use the cash flow to come up with the dividend yield. Riskless rate is 6%. If I value the put option, the value that I get for your option to abandon is about 73 million. What was the net present value standing alone? Minus 20 million. It was, if you look back, it was my, my, so we got 418 cash flows, 500 million initial investment. Your net present value is minus 20 million. I'm giving you a $73 million option by giving you this option to abandon. I'm not saying it's going to guarantee that you become my joint venture partner, but the more flexibility I give you to walk away, the greater the chance you become my joint venture partner. So here's the more general statement I'm going to make about this. Sometimes when you value a company, and especially companies which are very flexible. What are companies which are flexible? They seem, when they to make mistakes, they seem to get out much faster than everybody else. And when they succeed, they seem to build on those advantages much better than everybody else. There are some companies out there with a reputation. And usually it comes from management that's nimble and building a cost structure that's very, very flexible. If you're a company that has that flexibility, here's what this approach tells me. That if I do a DCF valuation of your company, I'm probably going to undervalue your company because I'm locking you into projects that you don't feel locked into. This is a reputation Goldman Sachs had. I mean, it's kind of dissipated a little bit pre-2009, 2010, which is they seem to get out. When they made a mistake, they seem to get out a little faster than everybody else. Though the conspiratorial minded say that's because... The Treasury Secretary is always a Goldman guy. Yeah. But that, you know, even without that, they seem to kind of escape quicker. And when they did something right, they seem to build on that advantage faster than everybody else. So if I did a DCF valuation of Goldman Sachs in those good old days, this is an argument for adding a premium on top of that DCF value. So when you think about flexibility, basically it shows up in that additional value. And it also gives you guidance on how you should design long-term projects. You want to design long-term projects in a way that you can escape your mistakes. So don't enter into long-term contracts if you can avoid them. Build in cost flexibility because it means that you can reduce your losses if things go bad. And by doing that, you've essentially increased the value of your company. So the option to delay shows up in patents and undeveloped reserves. The option to expand shows up everywhere today. Big data, networking benefits, platforms. So it's all over. So start applying it. And the option to abandon shows up in that flexibility you see built into some companies. Let's do one final option and we'll close up. So when you think about options in capital structure, and for those of you in the corporate finance class, we're kind of going through optimal debt ratios. For those of you who did, took corporate finance last year, you probably looked at optimal debt ratios. Right? Usually when you think about options in capital structure, it shows up in design of bonds. Right? You put convertible bonds, portable bonds, basically, Fixed income is really option pricing because so much of what you add to bonds takes on the role of option. I have zero interest in going there. I want to talk about one very specific use of option pricing that might be stretching the limits, but I think gives you some very interesting insights into why some companies might choose not to borrow as much as you think they should. So here's how it goes. Let's assume you have a company with a 10% debt ratio. You look at an, you know look at different different approaches. You come up with an optimal debt ratio of thirty percent for this company. It's under levered, right? And this is what traditional corporate finance your advice to them is: go out and borrow the money to get from ten to thirty percent. And why? And what's the rationale for doing that? If you do that, what will happen? 
your cost of capital will go down. And if your cost of capital goes down, your value as a company will go up. That's a, let's say the company pushes back and says, look, we know we're under levered, but we want to hold back that excess debt capacity just in case. Just in case what? Just in case a great project comes along, we not, we'd like to have excess debt capacity. They're using an options argument, right? And here's the options argument. By preserving that excess debt capacity, they're telling you we can take that great project when it shows up because we have excess debt capacity. I'm going to draw the payoff diagram. Next session, I'll actually put numbers. So here's how the payoff diagram looks when you think about using, because they're using, it's called financial flexibility. They're arguing keeping that excess debt capacity gives them financial flexibility. So here's how the option looks. If you have no excess debt capacity, let's assume there's a certain amount of financing you can raise. Either because you have internal constraints or external constraints, that becomes the strike price in the model. To the extent that you can bring in excess debt capacity, it allows you to take projects when they exceed that limit. So let's say your limit is, we can raise only 100 million every year, but because you have excess debt capacity, if a project comes along that will cost you a billion, you can take it. You take that project, and what you get as a net present value in the project becomes the payoff from having excess debt capacity. But could you hold on to excess debt capacity and that great project never shows up? Absolutely. In which case, what have you lost? What did you lose by being under levered? You had a much higher cost to capital than you needed to. That becomes the cost of preserving that financial flexibility. So next session, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Disney in, I think, 2000 and, and, or 1998, when I did this, show you the optimal debt ratio in the actual, and then compute how much the value of financial flexibility is to Disney and why they might choose to stay under level. So we'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>